Bob, self-awareness is one of our own most personal ways of thinking about ourselves. Uh, it's the deepest thing we know about ourselves. Uh, and, and yet, it's, it, when you think about it, self-awareness is so amorphous. How, how do you begin to define it? Can we learn anything about self-awareness by studying neuropsychiatric disorders? Yeah, I certainly think we can, and neuropsychology has long been fascinated uh, with exactly these kind of problems. There's a whole set of syndromes that are referred to collectively as anosognosias, mm. a lack of awareness of illness. Mm. And there seem to be a couple of different sources of anosognosia. Some people tend to have a lack of awareness of their bodies that tends to be linked to the entire body perceptual system. So there's a lot of our brain dedicated to our biggest sense organ, our skin, our mm. body surface. So messages are constantly being filtered up and then processed at a very high level about our entire body space. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of disorders of body awareness and sense of self seem to be linked to this fundamental sensory representation. Mm -hmm. But then there's a whole other set of syndromes that arise from the more frontal regions in the brain. Uh, the anosognosias of this type seem to reflect a more uh, fundamental a disconnect in our appreciation of who we are as individuals and, and what is the meaning of our self in relation what, to others. What are specific examples of that? Yeah, so there are people who um, not only have no sense of awareness of their own illness, but um, may not uh, identify themselves as being unique and separate from others, may not be able to separate the inputs that are coming from the outside world versus the inside world. And, and ha so, what would be the symptoms of that? So I mean, a classic symptom would be a, a hallucination, or a fascinating thing is the alien hand syndrome where the classic example would be a patient lying in a hospital bed after a brain injury has a fly land on their shoulder. They brush it off and say, why'd you do that to me? And there the idea is that there's a disconnect between certain brain systems that generate willed intentions and other paths to action where action is generated by stimulus inputs. Mm. And if there's a disconnect between these two systems, then one can actually have an action driven by the external stimulus world without having the sense that one generated the plan to do that. <laughs> and so then the logical assumption is, oh, well, somebody else must have done that because I didn't intend to do that. And so the same thing could happen if we have internal speech that is occurring that we don't have the sensation of having generated it ourselves. And if that's true, then one would sense that, oh, those voices must have been put into my head by some mm. other external agent. Mm. And so mm. these kinds of symptoms are, uh, I wouldn't say common, but do, do occur uh, with some regularity in syndromes like schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. Why that's important is that it shows that things that we, we take as self-evident are not so and that we have different brain systems which mediate all of these things that seem to be just part of our, of our fundamental uh, uh, un, undifferentiated consciousness. In fact, it's very differentiated. Yeah, I believe it is, in particular the ideas of what is personal agency and the sense of having the will to have uh, uh, done a particular action, mm. um, that these kind of things seem to operate on a particular neural architecture, um, which we have proof can be severed in, in the case of certain brain injuries. How do you do that? Well, um, we don't do it to people. We oh, uh, wait yeah. accidents of nature. Right. Um, and uh, poor, unfortunately, some people do have uh, lesions, particularly in the medial aspects of the frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain key regions that, if uh, damaged, seem to um, rob us of this ability to recognize that actions are part of our own plans. Uh, and then we may be buffeted by external stimuli. Some people are, um, uh, will, will perform what are called utilization phenomena, where they're so stimulated by the external world that it dominates their action. So if I see these magazines here, I might just have to touch the magazine and open it up yeah. because the object suggests, suggests that to me. It's not that I wanted to read this issue of neuron. <laughs> it's because it's there. Mm. Um, people may go to a doorknob and just feel like they have to, to turn the doorknob, mm. even though that's not part of their plan. It's not part of their behavioral program. Because the input from the world becomes so dominating and they, they have no ability to, to distinguish that uh, one set of stimuli from others? If you imagine that there's two usually balanced sets of uh, things that can drive us to action, one of which is our own internally willed intentions mm -hmm. and another which is external stimulus-driven intentions. And usually we balance these in a way that enables us to fluidly respond to exigencies of the environment and maintain our own behavioral program. But if one of them is broken, uh -huh then we can become dominated by the other. So in these states, the internal willed intention system is damaged, then we become dominated by the external world.
Uh -huh. Some people are impervious to the external world and, and are dominated only by their own intentions. <laughs> right. And sometimes they do it deliberately and sometimes not. And, 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 and that, that's, that's a gradient in individuals. Absolutely. In healthy people, obviously, there's a cycling across these different kinds of states. Right. And we all have had experiences where we can be dominated by one or the other. And, and there are neurological conditions where if I move my hand, sometimes I think, well, my hand is moving. And I'm not doing it. It's just it's just happening. I don't know why it's happening. And on the other hand, I can, I can be thinking I'm moving my hand, and I have that sense of moving my hand, and I'm not moving it. So so that d distinguishes those two concepts: the feeling I'm moving my hand, or the will to move my hand, and the physical act of doing it. Yeah, I think what you're highlighting is even a further distinction, which has to do with how conscious is our awareness of the actions that we're performing. Mm. Because we're always performing a whole bunch of activities right, and right. actions that are sort of subordinate to our master plan. Mm. So I'm making like certain kinds of hand gestures, yeah. but I didn't mean to make that yeah. hand gesture. A lot of muscle contractions and coordination, all sorts of things. It's all kinds of kooky stuff yeah. that's, that's uh, you know, affiliated with the master program. Mm -hmm. But I think that basically you can think about these behavioral programs as unfolding from some very primitive representation of the overall goal or drive. And then it gets reprocessed to uh, varying degrees of specificity all the way down to the control of individual motor units. Mm -hmm. And that breakdown can occur at any stage from the master plan all the way down to the peripheral implementation. So this feeling of self-awareness, which feels like a, a psychological unity, is really uh, 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 the composite of a whole series of other things. I believe so, and I believe it's graded all the way from the master plan all the way down to the, um, to the peripheral um, uh, uh, execution of, of tiny motor responses. And it's all a matter of where we focus the spotlight of attention. Um, and that is a variable process as well. Now, the mechanisms of that focal spotlight of attention that's been recognized since the time of William James, um, that remains um, a little bit less okay. clear but I think is one of the key questions of, of consciousness. Uh, what drives this spotlight? Um, you know, how does it operate? Um, how are brain activation states regulated? 